Well, as always, let me add my thanks to uh, all of our musicians and our choir and to Marsha today. What a blessing, as always, uh, to have such beautiful music in this place. And thank you all for being here as we share together in worship, in song, in prayer, and in praise. So we are on the final week of uh, what has been a six-week series uh, these last couple of months, this last month and a half. And the title of that series, again, in case you forgot it, is Questions Jesus Asked. And today's question uh, is quite a question. It comes from the passage in which uh, John the Baptist points out Jesus at the beginning of the Gospel of John. And that question is, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? Upon seeing John the Baptist and his followers after being identified as the Son of God by John the Baptist, Jesus' response to them is simply this. What are you looking for? We're going to dive right into our scripture today. We're in John chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. I've expanded this a little bit just to give us some context for this question. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one about whom I said, He who comes after me is really greater than I am because he existed before I did. Even I didn't recognize him, but after I came baptizing with water so that he might be made known to Israel. John then testified, I saw the Spirit coming down from heaven like a dove and it rested on him. Even I didn't recognize him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, The one on whom you see the Spirit coming down and resting is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that this one is God's Son. And the next day, John was standing again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus walking along, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he said. And they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he asked, What are you looking for? They said, Rabbi, which is translated teacher, where are you staying? He replied, Come and see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. So the question again, what are we looking for? What are we looking for? You know, on some level, I think that if we knew the answer to this, we wouldn't be following Jesus, would we? If we had a clear, concrete, concise answer to this question, what are we looking for? We wouldn't need Jesus as much as we do, and we need Jesus desperately. Jesus reminds us that what we should always be looking for is God. Specifically, Jesus reminds us that we should be seeking after a better relationship with God, seeking after the love of God, seeking after the truth of God. But Jesus also poses this question in reference to himself. What are you looking for in me? What are you looking for in my person, in my countenance? What are we looking for in the person of Jesus? In Jesus, we should be looking for the way and the truth and the life We should be looking for relationship, life, grace, and hope. We should be looking for the path that leads us to understanding, to deeper knowing. 
to union with God. And we should also be looking for the best versions of ourselves. We should be looking for God in ourselves. And Jesus is trying to show us this too. In short, we should be looking for the very power of God in Jesus. We should be looking for the power of God. So, how well do you all think we do that? How well do you think we do that? I think we try. I think we try really hard. We try our best. But the thing is, when we look for the power of God in Jesus and ourselves, we have to be so careful. When we are looking to Jesus to give us an example of that power, we often find we are looking for the wrong thing. We are looking for the wrong kind of power. In fact, oftentimes we're not really looking for the power of God at all. Instead, what we are looking for is force and control. When we look for force and control, we end up dominating others and acting on our worst instincts. When we look for force and control, we often end up building up structures and systems to enforce what we want to happen in the world. We end up causing harm, we end up endorsing violence, practicing judgment and condemnation instead of mercy and peace. And when we haven't experienced the right kind of power through God and Christ, the tragedy is we often become angry, we become afraid. In particular, we become afraid and angry at others whom we view as different. Now, this, this kind of fixation with power, this, this type of power that holds us captive so much of the time, uh, this is described well by, well, several folks that I'm going to share today, the first of which is a Brené Brown. I'm sure many of you know Brené Brown and have read her stuff before. She describes this kind of fixation with power as power over the other. And I've said this before, prepositions are so important, friends. They are so important because they determine the nature of our relationships. Power over instead of power with or power within or power between or power among. Brown says that this phrase power over is enough to send chills down our spines. When someone holds power over us, the human spirit's instinct is to rise and resist and rebel. And as a construct, it often feels wrong. In the wider geopolitical context, it can mean death and despotism even. And the danger for us in seeking this kind of power, it is always, almost always, our desire to dominate or control others. And we all see how this manifests in harmful ways. We see it every day in the workplace. We see it in the marketplace. We even see it in our own homes. And yes, we see it in the church too. We see it in the way that our public life is so often organized in racial hierarchies, in wealth hierarchies, in class hierarchies. And living in a world like this, we see it and we feel it. Living in a world like this makes everyone insecure and anxious. It so often cuts us off from the love of God. And moreover, very little of all of this around us, very little of this actually reflects the power of God and Christ, the real power of God and Christ. And so again, when we seek Jesus, what are we looking for? Is it the power of God or is it power over others? Another voice I'll raise up today is a, a, an author, David R. Hawkins. 
Uh, he wrote a pretty influential book a few years back called Power Versus Force. Power Versus Force. It's all about human habits, how our lives are organized. And he says of the difference between the two, he says force can bring satisfaction, but only power brings joy. Victory over others can bring satisfaction, but only victory over ourselves brings joy. So how do we get back? How do we get back to this joyful power of God? How do we get back to the experience that Jesus Christ is offering us? How do we answer this question? What are we looking for? Well, as is so often the case, this is easier said than done. We do it by reconnecting with God, by seeing God again in ourselves and in others, in everyone around us, never by giving in to our worst instincts, our judgments, our biases, our fears, or our hatred. The good power of God comes from the Holy Spirit. It comes from an authentic relationship with Jesus. It doesn't come from external validation. It comes from within. And when we discover this power in ourselves, an amazing thing happens. And that is that we no longer need to seek this power over others. This power over others that we are so often warned about. And we finally begin to recognize ourselves and each other again as children of God. And so the thing that we are looking for, the thing that Jesus gives us, it must be this inner power and never force or control or domination over others. We are not looking for that and neither is he. We are looking for humility. We are looking for completion. We're looking for understanding and we won't find it any other place. We will not find it any other place but here. The, uh, uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., wrote of this kind of good power. This not only will make us new people, but it will give us a new kind of power. It will be power infused with love and justice. And it will change dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. And it will lift us from the fatigue of despair to the buoyancy of hope. Dr. King also defined this power as the ability to achieve purpose. The ability to achieve purpose. And isn't that what we all seek in Jesus? But again, the, the challenge is that this way of living, this way of being, is almost never the expectation that is put on us by our culture, by our nation, by our world. Instead, we are expected to organize our lives around our individual desires, what is best for us, what is best for our ego, rather than what is best for God's people. But the story of Jesus is the opposite. Jesus shows us the opposite. He always seeks what is best for others, so much so that in the end, Jesus goes to the cross in death rather than choosing to conquer the world through violence or through force. Jesus chooses not to dominate others but to hold within himself the eternal power of God and uses it to redeem the whole world. 
And the result? Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, the women went to the tomb, bringing the fragrant spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. They didn't know what to make of this. Suddenly, two men were standing beside them in gleaming bright clothing. The women were frightened and bowed their faces toward the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He isn't here, but he has been raised. Remember what he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the human one must be handed over to sinners, be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. When they returned from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and to all the others. That, of course, is the resurrection passage from Luke. And so when Jesus asks us at the beginning of the Gospel of John, what are you looking for? It is kind of like the opposite of what is asked by the two men in this passage. We, we imagine them as angels, right? They're described here as two men wearing gleaming bright clothing. It's almost the opposite of that question. Their question is, why do you seek the living among the dead? But when Jesus asks us what we're looking for, he's asking us, why do you seek death in the midst of life? Why do you seek control, violence, vengeance, and hatred instead of the power of God? Jesus never seeks this kind of control. He gives himself up for the world and shows us that death never has the final word. Now remember, it is not only Jesus who God works through in this way. It is the disciples, it is the apostles, it is all of us, all of you. Throughout all of Scripture and history, God seeks the powerless and makes them powerful, not by granting them kingdoms or armies or military victories, but by giving them God's spirit to do God's wonderful things in the world. God is always seeking the broken to make them whole again seeking the downtrodden and the oppressed in order to liberate them, teaching all of us to seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. Everything else may be taken away, but this internal power endures forever. Jesus could have been a prince on a throne, wielding all of the world's riches and controlling all of its people, but instead he let everything go. He rejected the title of king and poured himself out in God's perfect love. He proclaimed a different kind of kingdom. And we have no choice, friends, we have no choice but to do the same for him. We are always either seeking the power of the world or the power of God. And so I'll I'll conclude today by offering just a few more reflections on where we are right now. Uh, I am praying. I am praying that as we move forward from last Tuesday's election, that we all remain in the light together. I pray for those who are grieving its results and for those who are comforted by them. Uh, In particular, I personally am praying for women and children and minorities who have been threatened with harassment, deportation, exploitation, and worse. And I pray that we all understand, we all understand, no matter where we're coming from, the consequences of acting out in hatred rather than acting in the full love of God. Friends, God is so much bigger 
than our petty disagreements. God is so much bigger than our politics. God is so much bigger than our media, our arguments. God is so much bigger and greater than all of this. At the end of the day, and in so many ways, presidential politics is our thing. It's not really God's thing. It's not to say that God doesn't care or that it doesn't matter. It does. But presidential politics is really our thing. And our politics only matter to the extent that we are using them to proclaim the gospel of Jesus, to care for one another, to practice God's compassion in the world, to help the poor, to heal the sick, to welcome the outsider. And most importantly, this place is called a sanctuary for a reason. It's because the love of Jesus provides Sabbath and rest for everyone. Everyone. It provides safety and refuge from the ways of the outer world. It is the one place we can come together to shed tears, to share in laughter, to give thanks, to raise up our joy and to love one another the way God and Christ love us. Hatred has no home here. Violence has no home here. Discord and strife have no home here. Only the power of God guides us. And so my hope for all of you, for all of us going forward, is that when you come to this place, you can lay down the stresses that you carry with you from every other part of life, from work, from school, from politics, from the news, from social media, from family tragedy, from everything. Lay it all before God and Christ and know that in this place we are dedicated to the holy practice, the only one that matters, loving our neighbor, and loving God. Amen.